not. A very warm welcome to this event. When we're going to be, hopefully you know what you're here for, but we're going to be discussing this book. And I'm delighted that we've got uh, two of the editors of the book and contributors of the book um, with us this evening and uh, one respondent, and I'm going to introduce them all in a few moments. Um, so my name's Helen Painter. I'm director of the Centre for the Study of Bible and Violence at Bristol Baptist College. The Centre for the Study of Bible and Violence is a postgraduate research centre looking to do work in two areas, um, looking at interpretation of biblical violence and also looking at um, the ways that the Bible is used in a violent world. And we do both um, academic research, but also seek to do um, output that is of value, we hope, to people in the churches as well. Um, so that's a little bit about us. And if you want to find out anything more, you can probably see behind me um, our, our web address so, uh, and our Twitter. Um, so do, uh, do have a look at that if you're interested in any of our work. But let's move on to the main purpose of this evening. We're here today to discuss the book, When Did We See You Naked? Edited by Jamie Reeves, David Toombs and Rocio Figueroa. Oh, I didn't get it right, did I? I'm sorry, I practiced beforehand as well. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> Let me introduce um, our panel this evening. So we have Dr. David Toombs with us today. He's a lay Anglican theologian and the Howard Patterson Chair Professor of Theology and Public Issues at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And I have to say, it is six o'clock in the morning there. So we do need to um, just honor the fact that he has got up very, very early to be with us. And I think probably there's a few others from New Zealand here tonight as well. Um, David's work draws on liberation and contextual theologies to address public issues. Our second um, contributor today is Dr. Rocia Figueroa, who is a Peruvian Catholic theologian, lecturer in systematic theology at the Catholic Theological College in Auckland. She's worked in the Holy See as head of the women's section in the Pontifical Council for the Laity. And her present research focus is theological and pastoral responses for survivors of church sexual abuse. And our third panelist today is Dr. Valerie Hobbs. Valerie is a linguist at the University of Sheffield. She researches and teaches on religious language and in her spare time enjoys writing about the Bible and making short videos exploring the Bible's use of symbols. So a very warm welcome to all three of you. Thank you so much for, um, uh, for being with us. Let me just make a few other remarks before we make a start. I, I will be recording it. Um, but I'm, as far as I'm, I've just noticed somebody requesting permission to record this. Um, is that all right with our panelists? It's rec recorded directly and put up on Mixcloud. No problem. Okay, I will be recording it. We are recording it and it will be up on um, uh, YouTube in the next day or two as well. Um, <clears throat> We were hoping that um, Dr. Elaine Storkey would be with us tonight, and she was planning to until yesterday when she needed to pull out for family reasons. So she sends her regrets and her apologies. Let me just make a few um, other general comments. Um, I guess you already will have realized, but let me just make it really clear that some of the conversations we're gonna be having and some of the topics we're gonna to be discussing tonight may well be very distressing. They might trigger painful memories or painful imaginations. If you need to, feel free to switch your screen off or of course to take time out. You can always catch up with the recording later if you need to. Please prioritize your own well-being and your own mental health. Um, with your event by booking, or with, you will have received an email with a set of um, help organisations in the UK and in New Zealand who can help you if, situation, if, if things are triggered today that you need to process with somebody. Um, if you're outside the UK or, the, or New Zealand, obviously I wasn't able to produce a list for the whole world, um, but I, d I don't know if we've got anyone from the US or other countries, but I'm sure that um, these do. There are obviously plenty of organizations there to help you. So please do make use of them. The other thing to say is that um, as some of you will be aware, this book has proved quite controversial. Um, and there's been quite a lot of discussion about it on social media and so on. Um, we're very much hoping that some of the, um, some of the conversations will be taking place um, in the safety of this room, but we do want this to be a safe room. We want this to be a place where um, people can listen well, whether we want there to be where there is disagreement, we want it to be expressed courteously. I'm sure that that will be the case tonight, but I think it's worth saying just because it has proved so very controversial on, uh, on social media recently. 
Um, one of the things that we always seek um, at the Centre for the Study of Bible and Violence is irenic dialogue. Um, and so good listening, um, respectful dialogue, and also remembering that we don't know the lived experience of the person we're talking to or others in this room. Um, we've already said, I think, but I'll just draw attention to the fact that we are being recorded. So if you don't want your image to be, um, to be visible, then do feel free to mute your screen. Our running order in just a few minutes then will be um, David first to uh, make some remarks about the, the book, then Rocio, who's also going to speak about the book, and then Valerie is going to respond. Then we're going to take a few moments just to um, grab a quick uh, glass of water or make yourself comfortable, and then we're going to come back and take questions. And I'll take questions from the chat um, uh, rather, than, uh, rather than unmuting people. Um, write your questions in the chat, either publicly or directly to me, and I will select from those to try to um, generate what I hope will be some fruitful conversation. We will definitely be finished by 9 p.m. Um, UK time. Only one more thing to do, and any of you who've been to any events that um, we run at the Centre for the Study of Bible and Violence will know that we always do this. We are always aware, um, tonight more than ever, but we are always aware that the subjects we discuss are never purely academic subjects. These are subjects that um, involve people being hurt, um, whether in the ancient world or in the contemporary world. And we always want to remember that, to position our conversation in that context and to take a moment to remember and to honor those for whom that is, um, that is their truth, that is their reality. And the way we do that is by lighting a candle and just observing a few moments of silence. And then I'll place the candle on the uh, table just behind me and you'll be able to see it burning for the rest of the evening. So would you just keep silent with me for a moment now, please? Okay, thank you for that. So we will make a start and uh, I'd like David to um, speak first, please. Thanks very much indeed, Helen, and wonderful to see everyone here. Uh, very, very pleased to have this invitation to speak. Very grateful to Valerie for the response and always an honor to be presenting with Rocio. Let me just start my screen share. So what I hope to do is uh, to give a quick outline of our book, the SCM book, When Did We See You Naked? Then to speak to the key biblical evidence, as I would see it, Matthew 27, 26 to 31, and then to share a few words on why I think this matters. So as Helen said, SCM have just published the book that Rocio and I have co-edited with our colleague and friend, Jamie Reeves of Sarum College. The title, When Did We See You Naked? Jesus as a Victim of Sexual Abuse. And we want to express our huge thanks as well to SCM for this and to all our contributors and everyone else who helped make the book possible. Here are the three of us, the three co-editors, myself and Rocio, who you'll hear from shortly, and Jamie Reeves, who is teaching this evening, so not able to be with us, but very much in our thoughts. The three of us believe that the book raises important questions on biblical, pastoral and theological issues around sexual abuse. And in our presentations this evening, I'm going to say a bit about the biblical and Rocio will speak to the pastoral. And we can pick up on the theological in the Q&A as, as well. The chapters feature 21 contributors from the US, UK, Ireland, Netherlands, Botswana, South Africa, Indonesia, Australia, and here in New Zealand. And they consider an understanding of Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse from various perspectives, womanist, feminist, liberation, and post-colonial 
theologies and biblical studies, social research, cultural studies, trauma studies, autoethnography, poetry, liturgy, and much more. It starts with a foreword from Assistant Bishop of Wellington, Eleanor Sanderson, and the 17 chapters are organized in four main parts. Part one deals with the biblical and textual issues, providing a foundation for the work, and I'll speak to that shortly. Part two is the Stations of the Cross, featuring poems by Podrego Tuma. Part three addresses culture, context, and perspectives. And part four moves to more personal issues around trauma and abuse and personal reflection. We've had some positive responses to the work already from people saying how important this reading is to them and what it means to them. On the SCM site, you can read the pre-publication comments from Linda Woodhood, Fernando Segovia, John Swinton, Sarojini Nadar, and Anthony Reddy. And this particularly generous comment on the book was offered by a reader in her blog review. We're looking forward to our launch at the end of the month, and we're very honored that the acclaimed womanist theologian from the US, Dr. Mitzi Smith, will be speaking. Dr. Smith's chapter, <clears throat> he never said a mumbling word, a womanist perspective of crucifixion, sexual violence, and sacralized violence, sacralized silence. It looks at the relationship between crucifixion and lynching, sexual violence and silence as being sacred. And Dr. Smith examines the ethical implications of viewing Jesus as a victim of sexual violence and the challenges of truth-telling in faith communities. It is a very powerful chapter, so do join us for that if you can. The launch will also feature a response to the volume by theologian, Professor Anthony Reddy. And I think Professor Reddy is going to pick up some of the more theological issues in the volume, which we particularly welcome. So my own starting point with this work stretches back over 20 years now to the article, David Toombs, Crucifixion, State Terror, and Sexual Abuse, which was published in Union Seminary Quarterly in 1999. And in this article, which is uh, available on the web, and I think it was in the link circulated for this event, I try to draw on Latin American liberationist hermeneutics for a reading of biblical texts with attention to both past and present contexts. It describes the dynamics of state terror and sexual abuse in the torture practices of authoritarian regimes in Brazil, Chile, Guatemala, and El Salvador in the 70s and 80s, and then uses this historical reality as a vantage point from which to re-examine Roman crucifixion practices that might shed light on biblical narratives. A slightly abridged version of this chapter is republished as chapter one in the book in the first section on biblical perspectives. So this evening, I want to summarize the main biblical argument for seeing the stripping of Jesus in the Praetorium and the forced nudity of crucifixion as sexual humiliation that should be seen as sexual abuse. If you want a bit more of the background to the work, you might be interested in this 35 minute episode of the Shiloh podcast, in which broadcaster Rosie Dawson talks to me and explores some of the background of the 99 article and how it came to be written. The two key biblical passages on which the argument on stripping is made are Mark 15, 16 to 20, and Matthew 27, 26 to 31. You can see the Matthew text here. When we work with groups, we usually read it together, and then we ask everyone to read it for themselves. And as they read it, to ask themselves how many times Jesus is stripped in these six verses. Even though it's a well-known passage, it's easy to miss some very troubling elements. So feel welcome 
and take a quick look. As you will have seen, there are two explicit references to Jesus being stripped in verse 28 and verse 31, marked here in red. In addition, I would also argue that there are two further implied or possible strippings referenced. In verse 26, the flogging implies stripping, since victims of flogging were usually stripped. At the end, an additional stripping that is still to come is referenced in verse 31, with the mention of crucifixion marked in blue. Roman crucifixions typically involve nudity, and there is good reason for believing that this was the case for Jesus. So the humiliation of two explicit and two implicit strippings are referenced here in just six verses. In addition, it's important to know that a cohort was about 500 men. That is a very large and hostile number. This is not a small event, but involves a lot of men and is intentionally organized. They are gathered. It's also interesting that Matthew has changed the language and included a detail that is not in Mark. Most commentators believe that Matthew was aware of Mark, so changes to the Mark version in Matthew suggest an intentional purpose behind the change. So just notice here, Matthew has, it seems, changed the language and included this extra detail. Whereas Mark speaks of calling together the whole cohort, Matthew says more. He writes, gathered the whole cohort around him. Furthermore, the word around used in the NRSV, so the English word around, is a translation for the Greek preposition epi. The emphasis seems to be on the proximity rather than distance. The whole cohort are not assembled to watch at a distance, but around Jesus. There's a suggestion of claustrophobia and possible threat. We get a suggestion of this closeness in this image, but note here there are only 12 soldiers. In the text, we're explicitly told there are about 500. So based on this passage and the parallel in Mark, I suggest that the stripping and enforced nakedness of crucifixion are a form of sexual humiliation, which is clear and explicit in the text and should be seen and described as sexual abuse. In addition, we don't know for sure what else the mockery might have involved. Is the mockery in verse 31 to be understood only in terms of what we read in the earlier verses? Or could the mocking refer to, or at least include, something more in verse 31, before Jesus is stripped again? There is a genuine question mark here. We will probably never know the answer, but it does deserve to be asked. So the argument here is that the sexual humiliation of stripping is itself a form of sexual abuse. Any additional sexual assault as part of the mockery would also be further sexual abuse, but Jesus being recognized as a victim of sexual assault is not dependent on this additional sexual assault. It's therefore appropriate to see Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse based on what is clear in the text. Whatever might be decided on the probability or improbability of the additional sexual assault, which the text might conceal. One of the reasons that we normally don't see this more clearly, I think, is probably that we have a different stripping or forced nudity in mind when we read these verses. Let me rephrase that. We probably don't have stripping or forced nudity in mind when we read these gospel verses. The stripping at the cross, featured in the tenth station of the cross, is often shown as quite a serene scene, which gives a false sense of peace. 
the theological emphasis in many of these images seems to be on Jesus's acceptance of death on the cross and undressing as preparation for this. By contrast, images of the stripping like this one from the Church of the Holy Cross in Caesar, Croatia, convey to my mind more of a sense of force and potential humiliation. But these are quite rare. These aren't the normal images we have in mind when we think of the stripping. My argument would be that the enforced nudity of crucifixion was both intentional and significant. There's good evidence, I think, to understand the nudity of crucifixion as being common Roman practice. And I think there's even stronger evidence for seeing that to be the case in the crucifixion of Jesus. We can come back and discuss that evidence more in Q&A if people are interested, but just to provide a summary, it seems to me a case can be made from the gospel texts themselves. There's also evidence in other ancient texts from Roman times. We have early evidence from early images by non-Christian authors, and we have evidence from early Christian writers who understood it this way. So there's four sources of evidence that can be drawn upon to understand crucifixion in terms of forced nudity and that this was the case for Jesus. I want to conclude before passing over to Rocio, who will pick up on the pastoral issues with a short answer to a question that we've often been asked, which is why does this difficult material matter? Is it helpful to be exploring this? Wouldn't it be better to try and forget it? Different contributors in the book offer a range of answers to this question and explore issues which are significant for both church and wider society. The chapter that Rocio and I have contributed, chapter 17, looks at survivor perspectives. One of the messages that our interviewees in this chapter offered us is that they saw Jesus's experience as important for the whole church and not just for survivors. I think they're correct and that more work needs to be done on this. To my mind, the importance for the wider church might be considered in at least three areas. First, what is recorded in the text matters. The text in Mark 15 and Matthew 27 is clear and explicit that Jesus was repeatedly stripped in a humiliating mockery involving about 500 soldiers and then displayed naked during crucifixion to die in front of a hostile crowd. Recognizing this and using the honest language of sexual abuse might make a difference to how we think about the text and how we think about Jesus. Second, recognizing sexual abuse matters. In comparison to when the 1999 article was published over 20 years ago, there is now much greater public awareness of sexual abuse as a widespread problem in society and in churches. There's also more awareness that sexual abuses can sometimes be hidden, hidden in plain sight. The evidence which should give cause for concern is often minimized or dismissed as unimportant. Abusers can take advantage of this to continue their abuse. Recognizing the stripping of Jesus as sexual abuse shows how easy it is to miss clear evidence of sexual abuse, even when the evidence should be obvious and is in plain sight. The churches and especially church leaders and anyone involved in safeguarding can take lessons from how the sexual abuse of Jesus has gone unrecognized and unacknowledged for so long. And third, responding to sexual abuse matters. In many conversations about the work over the years, there has been strong resistance to thinking of Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse. The reasons for this are varied, but often there's been a sense that shame and stigma would attach to Jesus if he is seen in this way. He would somehow be lessened. 
in people's eyes. Discussing Jesus' experience of abuse often surfaces these negative attitudes. The work, this work gives churches a good opportunity to explore and challenge the assumptions behind these harmful perceptions. A good way to explore these responses with groups is through the contextual Bible study developed by the Ujima Center at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. And the book includes a chapter by biblical scholar Gerald West, which describes the Bible study and connects it to both the rape of Tamar and also the stripping of Joseph. I hope people will want to read it and read the other chapters in the book for themselves. We know that people have different responses to the questions raised, but it's good to talk about these and to hear different perspectives. So in conclusion, seeing Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse can be difficult, but it matters because the text matters and recognizing sexual abuse matters and responding to sexual abuse matters. So this difficult conversation needs to be nurtured and facilitated for the whole church, and it needs to be especially sensitive and responsive to the experience and views of survivors. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to your questions and discussion later on after we hear from Rocio and then Valerie's response. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. That was a um, really helpful overview, and uh, actually I thought a very moving um, confrontation with the text there. Thank you. We will, um, so don't forget to start thinking about your questions, um, but for now we're going to move straight on to Rocio. So. Okay, that's fine. Hello everybody, and um, really thank you for this invitation. I'm happy to be with you and share uh, the chapter that we wrote with David, seeing his innocence, I see my innocence. My first inspiration to engage as a theologian with the reality of sexual abuse within the church was my own experience. I come from Peru, from a Catholic uh, family in Lima. My school was run by nuns. Since I was a young girl, I strongly felt the call um, from God to do something for, for the world. When I was 15 years old, I came across Sodalicio, a Catholic new movement in Peru that was catching the attention of Lima's high and middle class young people. Sodalicio is a lay movement with a few priests, but is led by a lay consecrated men from different countries. The Peruvian Luis Fernando Figari founded it in 1971. It was a very conservative group, continues being a very conservative uh, group. I was abused when I was 15 years old by the second in charge, Herman Doig. It took me 20 years to be able to face my own abuse. I was a member of the Marian Community of Reconciliation a Catholic Association of Lay Consecrated Women, which is the female branch of Sodalicio. Herman Doig, that you will be able to see in the, in the slide, had a great reputation for holiness within the community of Sodalicio, and he died. After his death in 2006, I began to receive reports of sexual abuse of main, male members of the Sodalicio community. Because of what happened to me personally when I was 15 years old, I believed the victims. So it made sense to me. And in 2006, I began an investigation inside within the community, inside the community. And I helped the victims to present a concession, uh, the, the, the uh, denounces to the court in Lima and to the Vatican in 2011. During this time, I developed a relationship of trust with the victims. And because of this, I felt the necessity to do even more work for survivors using my theological and pastoral research. research. 
Of course, a war began against me because the leaders uh, were involved and there were like five perpetrators of the leaders of the male branch and a war began against me. Um, and of course, they wanted to kick me out from the community because I was doing this investigation. And I contacted a journalist, uh, ex-member of Sodalicio, Pedro Salinas. In 2015, Pedro Salinas' book, Half Soldiers, Half Monks, about Sodalicio, was released. And it created a huge impact in Peru because Sodalicio was an important Catholic movement in Latin America uh, and in the United States and in other countries, and, and uh, particularly in Peru. And it was uh, like a bomb. Uh, I went publicly in television uh, with other victims because uh, they were uh, denying all the, um, the abuses that were perpetrated. At the end, because of the book and, and the response of the society in Peru, so the Alicio finally recognized and had to recognize after a commission that they organized 66 victims of fixed physical, psychological, and sexual abuse and set aside a fund of nearly 4 million for reparations. I left, of course, the community in 2012 uh, after being 20 years being a nun. And actually, I met my future husband who is a New Zealander, and that's why I'm, I'm in New Zealand now. And I came to live in New Zealand in 2014. Uh, as, as you can imagine, after 20 years, I need a lot of time for healing and, and for recovering. And really, I have to say that New Zealand helped me a lot. Being in New Zealand helped me a lot. And actually, when I was in New Zealand and in this process of healing, in a, cash, in a very, um, I read the news that David Toms was coming to New Zealand to be the, um, responsible for the Center for Theology. But just Googling, I found his article of 1999 about the idea of Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse and relating Jesus's sexual humiliation was important for me of how I felt uh, about my body and how it was sexually humiliated. The article made sense to me, and I was surprised that I never thought about the humiliation of Jesus's body. At the same time, it touched me because many of the, my friends who were victims of sexual abuse uh, told me the story of how the founder um, not just abused them sexually, but one of his practice was uh, imposing them to be nude, to mock them. Of uh, regarding their bodies. And when I read the article of David Toombs, I remembered the stories that they told me and how fragile and vulnerable and humiliated they felt. So I uh, met personally David Toombs and we began working together. The first outcome was um, research giving voices to male victims regarding the spiritual consequences of abuse. It had as title, listening to male survivors of church sexual abuse, voices from survivors in Sodalicio. Then we did another study. This second study was much closer to this current study and we explored responses to a reading of Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse. Many of the participants of the first study participated in the second one. And the chapter that I will share with you today is seeing his innocence, I see my, my innocence. Why this chapter? We wanted to build on the earlier interviews that we did with male victims, but speak now to a group of female victims. We chose to speak to nuns for two reasons. First, in 2019, the sexual abuse of nuns in the church attracted global attention. We wanted to learn more about their experiences. Pope Francis, for the first time, publicly acknowledged the problem of priests and bishops sexually abusing nuns. 
This was the first time that the problem had been, had been so publicly acknowledged. And we had an event in which some of ex nuns like me, we gave our testimony publicly in Rome, and that was a big, um, big event that, that went all over the world. From 1994, um, it was, this was not, not new because from 1994 there were reports from Maura O'Donoghue to the Vatican about the abuse of nuns and the Vatican did, not, did nothing. Second, a 2013 study by Gloria Duravilla, Roland Littlewood and Gerard Levy had interviewed a group of contemplative nuns in Spain who had experienced sexual abuse within the church. Some of the abused nuns had stated that they found it consoling to reflect on the suffering of Jesus. We have um, some studies about uh, the abuse of nuns, but not many. In, in, so let's speak now about our interviews. I interviewed five female survivors of sexual abuse four of whom are former nuns and one is a current nun. Two of them have been, uh, had been abused as children by relatives and three had been abused as adults within the church. The participants uh, were nuns from Germany, France, Peru, Argentina and Philippines. As preparation for the interviews, we asked participants to read a version of crucifixion and sexual abuse 2019, or a short summary, which I prepared. The abuse incidents disclosed range from penetrative sexual abuse for participants to non-penetrative sexual touching all participants. I held the interviews with them, with each of them, for more or less 40 minutes. The interviews were transcribed translated and analyzed. There has not been many, um, let's, let's talk about now about the, the, um, the questions that we had for our work. So we had five questions that we asked to the survivors. The first is what impact of a, on uh, the impact of your vocation on faith, on response to the sexual abuse. The second was whether they had previously viewed their abuse in light of the suffering of Jesus. The third, whether the reading on crucifixion and sexual abuse was new to them and whether they felt it persuasive. The fourth, the significance, if any, that understanding Jesus as a victim had for them. And the fifth question, uh, question, their views on the significance of this for the wider church. In the first question, um, vocation and faith was significant for all, for how all the participants responded to their experience. I will just quote some of their responses that are important. So, one was what Maria said, being a religious sister made it very difficult for me to channel or know how to direct the rage that I felt or even to allow me to be angry and allow myself all those negative feelings. The second question was if they had a previous identification with, suffering, with the suffering of Jesus. Four of the participants had made some previous connection and one had not. For two of the participants, this connection had been helpful. For one, it was mixed, and for the other one, it was negative. Lillian answers. I asked the question, why me? Why has this happened to me? The answer that came to me was the picture of the crucifixion. God cries for me. God also suffers with me. For me, this is a great consolation. 
In the third question, um, we ask about their emotional response about the idea of Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse. Uh, for four of them, this was a new, new idea, one of the participants had recently come across uh, this idea of Jesus as a, sexual, as a victim of sexual abuse in internet after it was presented at a conference. The, the response of Tina uh, was this, it is so strange that Jesus has not been considered a victim of sexual abuse. I think that it is because we have this whole victim blaming culture and the idea that victims of sexual abuse have actually done something to provoke it. Picturing Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse makes it entirely clear that the victim is innocent. Regarding the assessment of the significance for the participants, one replied that it would have been very helpful in the past, but for her, it had no relevance, relevance now. She overcame the abuse and she didn't think that it was now useful to think about Jesus as a victim. Uh, one said it was not personally helpful for her because she lost her faith. So seeing Jesus or not was not a, a reality that really she was indifferent. Uh, and two of the survivors, um, the other three participants saw the idea as helpful for them. Franca said, yes, this thought is a help, a comfort, a source of consolation for me. Regarding if it has any significance for others and the church, all of the participants, and this is interesting, while not all of them saw a significant, significant for them, Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse, but just two, regarding the church, they considered that it was significant for the church and offered an opportunity of positive change in how the church viewed survivors. Lucia affirmed, for the church, of course, because it can be a topic that usually is silenced. Uh, it was powerful experience to hear the responses offered. One of the most moving uh, statements came from Maria, and we have used it for the title of the discussion paper. Maria said, despite saying to myself, you are not guilty, one part of me in my innermost part maintains my guilt and leads me to accuse myself. You could have done something to avoid abuse. And then I have the experience and the knowledge that Jesus was innocent. That makes it easier to believe that I am innocent. It has been a beginning. Reading it has been like a relief. It is not just on a theoretical level. There is an emotional level that helps me to go into my heart. I love Jesus. I don't blame Jesus. I don't say to him, you had to do something. You could have avoided it. Seeing his innocence, I see my innocence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rocio. Again, that was just really moving. Um, thank you, really helpful. I've had one or two questions come in, um, but please do be thinking about questions you'd like to ask in due course. Um, but for now, we're gonna hand directly over to Valerie, who's going to give a response, having had a few weeks to look at the book. Thank you. Hi everyone, thank you for this opportunity. I'm just working on getting my screen share ready. Oops. Right. <clears throat> Back to my first slide. So thank you for this opportunity to give a response to this rich edited volume. I was asked mainly to focus on the first six chapters of the book, which explore the biblical text and historical sources related to Jesus's crucifixion. 
but I'll be engaging with some of the other chapters as well. But before I do that, I want to briefly explain a bit about myself as a situated reader, shaped by experience and expertise, which I bring with me to the book and which shape my responses to it. So first I read this volume as a Christian. I approach the historical possibility of Jesus as a victim of sexual violence, as someone who loves Jesus, who has been saved by Jesus. When his body was violated and broken, it was broken for me. So I encountered this book through the lens of my union with Christ, with my God. Related to this first point, I read this book as someone who sees pictures of Jesus as a confession of the incarnation. I know some who are reluctant to attend tonight, who are even reluctant to read this book because of the image of Christ on the cover. I have chosen to use some images of Christ as God embodied in my response tonight, and some will object to that. I want to make clear that I do not see these as pictures of God proper, but as representations of the historical fact of God's human body. Having been, having been raised in churches that downplayed Jesus's humanity, I affirm the significance of the confession of the incarnation in art, not as images abstracted from a historical context, but explicitly acknowledging this history, this fact. I believe that in these images, we're not making God for ourselves. We are remembering what God has done. I also read this volume as a woman, a white woman. So I approach the book mindful that certain aspects of my lived experience shape my interaction with the chapters that touch on, for example, male on male sexual violence and the interconnectedness of race, racism and sexual violence. I also read this volume as a survivor of sexual assault and other forms of abuse at times perpetrated by people who also call themselves Christian. I encounter this book through the lens of my own trauma. And finally, I'm a scholar, specifically a linguist. One of my, aim, my main areas of expertise is religious language. I'm interested in the ways we use language to talk about, to make sense of our most deeply held beliefs and experiences, to form and break down sacred community, to help us cope with some of life's pr most profound moments. Central to the first chapters in this volume is imagery, but also the matter of language. How do we talk about Jesus's crucifixion? In the introduction, Jamie, Ream, Jamie Reeves and David Toombs write this, despite the display of so many images of Jesus's body hanging from a cross, we're unable to see what is right in front of us. When it is named in ways that make the shame and humiliation more explicit, this naming is often resisted. What is right in front of us? The resistance to naming it. As I read the volume, I kept returning to these two elements. So I'll use these to structure my response. But I want to talk about these in reverse order. And that's because the act of preventing us from naming Jesus as a victim of sexual violence can be part of what likewise prevents us from naming the violence we ourselves suffer. As Gerald West reports in chapter six, the women of South Africa paged back and forth in their Bibles to confirm that the story of Tamar was indeed in their Bibles for none of them have ever heard of it. That story had been withheld from them. The naming of Tamar's violence had been hidden. Naming Jesus as a victim of sexual violence, his stripping, his humiliation, the meaning that the history of crucifixion attaches to the account of Jesus's death, this is something new to many of us. As the various authors of the book discuss, this naming has been prevented, resisted, hidden. As Jeremy Punt writes, oftentimes the interpretive focus on Jesus's humility turns crucifixion and its abuse into abstract notions that drown out the New Testament's emphasis on his humiliation. Why is this? Why is a vulnerable Jesus, victim of sexual abuse, so startling, so new, so strange to so many of us? 
What we pay attention to is largely determined by our expectations of what should be present. This is what, what Christopher Chabry says in the New York Times. He's a cognitive psychologist and co-author of The Invisible Gorilla. Without expecting something, we're unlikely to pay attention to it, he says. And when we're not paying attention to something, we are surprisingly likely to not see it. So in part, we do not see what is right in front of us because we do not expect Jesus to be a victim of sexual abuse. But what governs these expectations? What has shaped them? The book authors have their own answers. And I first want to respond with some of my own experience of this. In 1996, just before I arrived on campus for my undergraduate studies, Christian activist Charles Wysong entered the chapel of Covenant College in Georgia in the United States and destroyed three of the artist Edward Nipper's paintings. Among the most objectionable paintings, according to Wysong and others, were depictions of a suffering naked Christ on the cross. According to Wysong, Nipper's work was turning the Bible into a nudist colony. This act of violent defacement was hugely formative for me. At this point in my life, I did not recognize that what had happened to me as a child was sexual assault. No one had named it for me in this way. No one had used images, let alone language, to represent experiences like these. As an 18-year-old, I grappled with the meaning of Wysong's objections to Nipper's paintings. I probed my own feelings of resistance to seeing Jesus in such a vulnerable pose. In this encounter with Jesus as a victim of sexual violence, Wysong's vandalism unwittingly and ironically allowed me to plant seeds of compassion towards myself within my psyche. I began to seek the language for what had happened to me, a naming that suited what I had suffered. I wondered about what would prompt rage like Wysong's. As my Christian reconstructionist childhood pastor expressed full support for Wysong's violence, I wondered about why Jesus as a fully embodied human being was so unacceptable to men like these. I began to consider the meaningfulness of their skewed vision of Jesus as towering bastion of supreme masculinity, the Jesus they wanted, the Jesus they saw in themselves. In the book, Gerald West writes this about victims of male-on-male -male sexual violence. Jesus is not a normal male, and so he is stripped and abused by hegemonic males. Among his disciples today are those who are stripped, abused, and raped because dominant forms of masculinity are intent on exerting power over anomalous men. Why has the sexual violation of Jesus, not to mention his sexuality, never been a serious investigation in New Testament studies? Jeremy Punt writes that the answer may lie in an apparently minor detail, the emphasis on Jesus's humility to the exclusion of considering also his humiliation on the cross and everything this could have implied. So there is resistance because of hegemonic masculinity. And as Mitzi Smith and other writers in the volume make explicit, there is resistance because again, silence and shame around sexual abuse is one way perpetrators of violence and those who enable them keep victims under their control. And some of us have internalized that silence, that shame. For many of us, it does not feel better to seek solidarity with Jesus because he experienced sexual trauma. In chapter 16, Chanel Smith wrestles with this, writing that revisiting Jesus's sexualized trauma in the gospel passages exacerbates the pain and shame I feel as I relive my own. I never thought about whether Jesus was sexually violated. Oh no, it would be blasphemous for God to allow that to happen to God's own son. Too troubling regarding the notions of Jesus's purity and too human in terms of the vile and disgusting experiences that we as sinful folk experience. And yet, for many others, there is freedom in, res in refusing the resisting of naming, even when it arises within ourselves. 
Gerald West reports that women in South Africa said upon learning about the story of Tamar, if this story is in the Bible, then we will not be silent. I turn then now from what is resisted to what is right in front of us. What is right in front of us? What does this mean being right in front of us? To help in this noticing, to borrow a term from my field of linguistics, Reeves, Tombs, and Figueroa's book offers us detail around the historical act of crucifixion itself, what it intends, what it enacts, what it represents. This helps to, to provide what Jeremy Punt, when talking specifically about the letters of the Apostle Paul, later calls a matrix within which the sexual abuse of Jesus may be implied. Crucifixion, as a form of public execution, was a deterrent intended to shame and humiliate, to dishonor. In another publication discussing this, the scholar Sean Adams writes, it's difficult for modern scholars to understand the dread that this symbol of Roman power invoked, the shame, the humiliation that was associated with it. The whole process of crucifixion was designed to humiliate the victim and maximize the amount of shame and suffering that person incurred. Regardless of whether the person was still living or dead, this type of public exposure stripped the victim of their last vestiges of honor, leaving them entirely shamed. As David Toombs argues, the sexual element in Roman practices was part of their message of terror. Quote, victims were crucified naked in what amounted to a ritualized form of public sexual humiliation. In a patriarchal society where men competed against each other to display virility in terms of sexual power over others, the public display of the naked victim by the victors in front of onlookers and passersby carried the message of sexual domination. So crucifixion as a tool of terror by the state was reserved for those who needed to be put in their place. Anyone who opposed the Romans. It was a shameful death reserved primarily for slaves and non-citizens. A calculated way of displaying authority, especially over the lower classes to discourage serious crimes. Here is Jeremy Punt again. Since slaves were sexually available to their owners, and because of the cross's association with slavery, this adds another intersecting sexual dimension to the practice of crucifixion. So part of what is right in front of us then is this historical record. And we find this not just in connection with first century Rome, which is significant enough, but in other parts of the world, Sri Lanka, Libya, Syria, Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Myanmar, Myanmar, the United States, all contexts where mistreatment of prisoners has involved a range of sexual abuses. Beyond this historical context of crucifixion, which again is right in front of us, also right in front of us are the testimonies, the research, the definitions of experts on sexual abuse and of survivors. In a publication on sexual and gender-based violence published by the UN, sexual violence is defined in ways that are not just limited to physical violence and includes not only unwanted sexual comments or advances, but also notably forced nudity. <clears throat> Dr. Maria Soholm, expert in international human rights law, helps us understand more fully this link between forced nudity and sexual violence. Forced nudity has been considered to be a form of sexual violence within the field of, of international criminal law. I note here the emphasis on instilling fear, vulnerability, loss of dignity in the individual. As Jamie Reeves and David, David Toombs ask, what sort of abuse is stripping and forced exposure if it is not sexual abuse? Public stripping, enforced nakedness, and sexual humiliation constitute sexual abuse because they are attacks on sexual identity and sexual vulnerability. Though my response here doesn't cover the entirety of the when did, you see we, when did we see you naked volume, 
What is also right in front of us are the accounts of survivors of sexual abuse, which inform expert definitions like those I've just mentioned and many others. In chapter 13, Mapula Diana Kabanyilwe explores the crucifixion in the light of the multiple sexual, sexual abuses suffered especially by women and girls in Botswana. She writes, Botswana, Botswana women are beaten and stripped naked. Jesus too was beaten, stripped naked and mocked. Writes Mitzi Smith, I am a survivor and Jesus would say me too. And ironically in the church, even in our documented refusal to pay attention to what is right in front of us, Christians have also repeatedly made this connection between Jesus' suffering and sexual violence. In chapter three, Mitzi Smith makes connections between the lynching of black bodies, sexual violence, and the crucifixion of Jesus. She explores the impact of the ritualized performance of silent suffering on the traumatized black women, children, and men who sit in the pews. This was recently memorialized in songwriter Keith Watts' song, O Sacred Neck, Now Wounded, for the Porter's Gate, in memory of the murder of George Floyd. However, Smith also explores how some in the Black church also use this connection between Jesus and Black victims of violence for ill to practice an ethic of silence around sexuality and sexual violence. Smith writes that through African-American spirituals, like he never said a mumble in word, Black churches, but of course not only Black churches, have made the policing of Black women's bodies, speech, and personal spiritual narratives one of its primary tasks. I read one of the implications of her chapter as this, that whether we want to think of Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse or not, these connections have already been made sometimes, maybe often in ways that have only increased the suffering of victims. Jesus was supposedly silent, so you should be silent too. Then finally, there is the language of the Bible, also right in front of us. In chapter two, Michael Trainer guides us through the gospel's accounts of Jesus's crucifixion and the meaningfulness of events surrounding it. In the gospel of Mark, for instance, the sexual innuendos of the scene are heightened by the explicit references to Jesus being stripped as part of his humiliation. As Mark tells us, the soldiers divide Jesus' garments among them. What is presumed in the text is that Jesus is once again naked. Other authors give us more detail about this matrix of meaning that the biblical text assigns to crucifixion layer upon layer. In chapter six, Gerald West, writing about Joseph, Tamar, and Jesus, says, the biblical text itself is decisive, making it clear that Joseph's brothers stripped Joseph of his garments, which you can see in this faded image from Munich Rashi's commentary on the Bible. Joseph's stripping in transtextual turn summons the implied stripping of Tamar. Tamar leads us back transtextually to Joseph, and both leads us transtextually to Jesus. And then also, as Jeremy Punt's chapter highlights, there is the Apostle Paul's strong emphasis on the shame, the humiliation of Jesus' crucifixion, which further fleshes out this matrix within, the sec within which the sexual abuse of Jesus may be implied. We can take this further, and Monica Poole nods at some of these ways. Considering the ways an original act of violence not only harms the victim, but also harms the community. Michael Trainer picks this up too in chapter two. What happens to Jesus, prophetic head, will also happen to his followers if it is not already happening. When did we see you naked? Jesus' followers would soon see Jesus' suffering in the least of these, even among themselves. Again, the biblical text encourages us to think in this way. Monica Poole provocatively notes that Mary's role in her encounter with Jesus at the tomb, this is where Jesus says, touch me not, has often been connected with the Shulamite woman in the Song of Solomon, who sought out her lover and held him, and would not let him go, 
as a reader, I see more ways the text connects the Shulamite woman to the matrix of meaning around Jesus's crucifixion. As I was reading, I, my thoughts went to this text from Song of Songs, which like the accounts of Joseph and Tamar, evoke the stripping of Jesus. In chapter 12, Nicholas Lee explores the female Christ figure, the so-called Christa, a recurring motif in Christian feminist theological writing since the 1970s. But the connection of Christ to the suffering of women is much, much older. The biblical scholar Susan Smith draws attention to a small but significant group of 15th century manuscripts of the Biblia Pauperum, the disrobing of Christ prior to his crucifixion. This is not in the book, but this is where my mind went. This is presented within an intricate typological nexus found nowhere else in medieval art or literature. Key to that typology is a rarely depicted episode from the Old Testament, the stripping and scourging of the sponsa as related in this verse, Song of Songs 5-7. So you can see this in the lower right-hand corner of the image below the image of the disrobing of Christ. Smith writes that this unique cross-gendered prefiguration has built into it multiple layers of allegorical references, which include the ascription of a female aspect to the body of Christ based on the identification of his body with the church, which the sponsa signifies. Moreover, insofar as the sponsa also signifies the individual soul, the, the typology in question makes a direct appeal to the viewer to love and to identify with Christ's stripped suffering body. In this, we see the mystery of the Christian doctrine of totus Christus, or the whole Christ. In Acts 9, Jesus asks Saul on the road to Damascus, Saul, why do you persecute me? The unity of Christ and his church, especially in suffering, is a theme throughout the Bible. St. Augustine said, it was not that Christ would be incomplete without us, but that he did not wish to be complete without us or without a church. He was stripped, assaulted, abused, humiliated, isolated, abandoned in perfect innocence, and in so doing freed us from all our shame. But here we meet a warning against those who would perpetrate the kinds of abuse Jesus suffered, those who would turn a blind eye to violence, who would gaslight, and shame victims. For as Jesus tells his disciples, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for the least of these, you did not do for me. As we encounter the stripping of Jesus in the Bible, his torture and humiliation, his crucifixion then, we carry with us all that is right in front of us. This historical and literary biblical context, the expertise of victims of domestic violence and those who advocate for them, all of these shade the meaning of Jesus' crucifixion. As Punt writes again in chapter four, and this is a crucial point, words get meaning not from dictionaries, but from their use in social systems and contexts. So this includes not just naming an event like the crucifixion, not just using a word like stripping or naked, but also the denotation that the naming accomplishes, the associations attached to the crucifixion, to the stripping, to the praetorium that Toombs writes about. As Jeremy Punt writes, Paul did not explicitly identify the crucified Jesus as a victim of sexual violence, but the emphasis on the shame and humiliation of the cross and literary evidence of the sexual humiliation and abuse of victims suggests that Jesus may not have been spared this dignity. The shamefulness of the cross should take the bigger picture into consideration. When have we seen Jesus naked? Most of us, we have not. Perhaps we're still ashamed of him. Yet we must see. For paraphrasing Rosio Figuerera and David Toombs, seeing his innocence, partaking in his innocence, we now see our innocence. 
So I leave you with the words of Paul and Timothy to the saints in Philippi. I will rejoice for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ. According to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now as always be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. Three, I think, really, um, really powerful presentations. Hugely grateful to all three of you. I think it would be good for, uh, for more than one reason, actually, just to take a break. Um, so I'm going to propose that we take a five minute break. I make it 13 minutes past. So I will restart promptly at 18 minutes past um, so we can try and fit in as many, much discussion, as many questions as possible. But once again, um, huge thanks to, uh, to David, to Rosia and to Valerie. Thank you. Welcome back. Um, I've got quite a few questions uh, in my hand here. More may pop in, but there's certainly plenty um, of uh, possibility for discussion um, to take us uh, well up to nine o'clock, I think. Um, David, there's a, a factual question that's popped into the chat that you might be able to answer um, just in, in the chat there. Um, but I'm going to begin with this one. Um, are you claiming that Jesus was that historical Jesus was abused or that contemporary understandings of sexual abuse provide a lens for recognizing nuance and brutality in the gospel accounts? Who'd like to pick up on that one? I, I'm very happy to, to speak to that one, Helen. So as, as I heard the question, it was, uh, are we saying that Jesus was sexually abused or is it that um, contemporary sexual abuse provides a lens for recognize, for reading the text? Did, did I get that right? Yeah. So for, for me, um, I think everyone can answer this for themselves. That there's no single answer that needs to be insisted on. I can only answer my, uh, offer my own perspective on it. And, and for me, there's no meaningful question as to whether or not Jesus was sexually abused in the text. It, it's a clear yes. I, I think any reading of the text in today's language for sexual humiliation, which is clear there, should be named as sexual abuse. Uh, there's this further question around what else might have happened. And that's an important question to ask. But for me, asking the first question and giving a clear answer to that, that Jesus was a victim of sexual abuse, then provides the appropriate context for dealing with that second question. What, what else might there have been? So that is one of the issues we, we try to address in the book. And it was a very conscious choice to subtitle the book. Jesus as a victim of sexual abuse, not as a possible victim, not maybe a victim. For, for me, the stripping and forced nudity are clearly sexual abuse. We, we could go into some of the technical definitions which are used in the Royal Inquiry we're having here in New Zealand on abusing care and the support that I think those would give for that as an understanding of sexual abuse. I realize these are 21st century terms that they were not the terms that the uh, people of the day used, obviously, and they weren't speaking English, but it seems to me these are the appropriate terms if we want to properly understand what happened to, to Jesus. So for me, the answer is yes. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in on that? Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, right, let me um, come to this question. Is there a danger that the um, identity of, um, I've, my, uh, my notes, not sure if it's identity or idea, I think it'll become clear. Is there a danger that the idea of the virgin sexually pure Jesus as innocent might actually feed victim blaming um, of sexually assaulted women who aren't, who are sexually active? Did that, did I read that? Does that make sense? 
Helen, can you repeat the question, please? Yes. So is there a danger that um, the con focusing on um, sexually pure Jesus as, um, as a victim of sexual abuse might actually feed um, victim blaming of um, victims who are sexually active? I can answer to that. I, I think really that by the contrary, you know, usually um, uh, the blaming of uh, usually victims always feel guilty, you no? Know, because or they or if they are uh, sexually active or if they are not sexually active. So I think it, it doesn't feed more by, by the contrary, because um, as I say, for me, it's is that the common consequence of sexual abuse is feeling guilty about it and feeling that you are responsible about it. And I think that by the contrary, feeling that someone uh, has suffered sexual abuse and is innocent uh, can help, uh, help victims to understand their own innocence. So um, I, don't think, uh, I don't think that it will feed uh, blaming, blaming culture by, by the contrary, because in the culture, there is usually this, this idea of something has, the victim, something has done, something wrong has done to provoke, uh, to provoke the abuse. So it's like a cultural element also that is very present, that always the, the victim has in one way responsibility about it. So I think that understanding that there is no responsibility in, in abuse, uh, you can see your own innocence at the same time. Valerie, thank you. Thank you, Monsieur Valerie. I mean, taking us back to the biblical text, there's evidence there as well that we don't need to think only in terms of innocence um, as, a, as a pure innocence of Christ. When James says, help the poor, help the loveless, he's not saying, you know, but wait, they did some bad things. We can position people in terms of their, um, their harm, the, the, those who are harming and those who are harmed in terms that, that the Bible guides us to do. Um, and, and, you know, Jesus himself sets the model for that identifying people who are vulnerable in society and turning his attention to them. He didn't, he didn't identify them based on their worthiness. That wasn't even a question. It was their suffering that mattered. And that's, you know, we don't think in terms of innocence. We think in terms of, of who, is, who is the one who is harming and who is the one who has been harmed. Um, so I'll just add that to the, to the, question, to the, to the answer. Thank you. I've got another question which is related. Can I feed this one in, David, and then I'll come to you because I think this is this is linked. Um, so theologically, it's important that Jesus knowingly and willingly submitted to the violence he endured. In fact, in one sense, he, he chooses it. Does this problematize um, connecting what he experienced um, with, with other victim survivors of sexual abuse? I think that is a kind of linked question in terms of victim blaming. David, can I, were you wanting to come in? Thank you. Thanks for that, Helen. Uh, so I would hear, hear that, what um, the view just expressed as a strongly theological view. And from the liberationist approach, my reservation would, would be not to rush to the theological, but to root the theological in lived experience and um, social analysis first. So as, as a strong theological view, it wouldn't be to start with that as, well, that is the case, but how do we understand the violence of the cross and reflect on that theologically? And you might come to the conclusion that uh, Jesus uh, willingly and uh, readily accepted it, or you might come to the conclusion that that is uh, a view to be questioned, problematized, challenged. Now, we haven't done much in, in this panel to explore the theological consequences of, of some of these ideas. Um, and I'm probably going to dodge it for the moment, as it were, other than I suppose to say, I'm not sure that is my view. I, I think maybe that's an unhelpful theological response 
to the very difficult and challenging violence of the cross. And for some people, a way to deal with that difficulty is to assume, well, Jesus must have embraced it, must have readily embraced it. Now, there's a whole conversation around the biblical texts which might support that. There's a whole theological infrastructure around that, I do agree. But I think first we need to understand what happened. Then we can have the conversation around, well, how do we theologically make sense of that? And we're still very early in terms of having the conversation around what, what happened. The other point I'd like to mention, just going back to the previous conversation, as I said at the outset, it really is helpful to distinguish the biblical, the pastoral and the theological on these aspects. And of course, they all interact. In terms of pastoral consequences, in my experiences, most biblical and theological ideas can be helpful in some circumstances and harmful in others. It all depends on what, what we do with them and how we think of them. This, this is true in my experience, talking about sacrifice, talking about forgiveness, talking about almost all religious ideas. So some of my reflection on the previous question would, would be in terms of the biblical aspect, it doesn't make much difference to it. In terms of the pastoral aspect, it makes a huge difference to it, but it's strong reasons to have the conversation well so that it's not developed in harmful ways as it could be, uh, but that's only likely, and it's only likely to develop a conversation in helpful ways if we do have the conversation and don't rule it out at at the outset. And, and that would be the same, I suppose, in terms of an answer to this question. We then need to ask, well, where was Jesus in relation to this? Was this voluntary and readily accepted? Or is that an interpretation which isn't actually helpful to the reality of the violence he, ex he experienced? Thank you. Would either of the other two panelists like to come back? Okay, thank you. I think that leads us into the next question I'd like to ask, um, which is kind of a, a linked pair, perhaps. Um, how would you, and I think you've, you've begun to touch on this, but it'd be lovely to hear more about how you think this could pastorally be used. Would you, would you preach it? Would you, um, would you use it in kind of counselling within a church? And I suppose the related question is, given that, as we know, some people... Um, have quite strong negative reactions to this. Do you think that um, the potential benefit to those who find it help exceeds the potential harm, or perhaps harm is too strong a word, but the potential negative effects to those who find this unhelpful? I would like to answer that. Um, I think um, because it, for some people, can be harmful, I think like in any pastoral approach, you have to be very personal because when you talk about any topic, any topic can be harmful for someone in a, in that, in when he's not in the right moment. You know, when you talk about uh, God, just the word God or Jesus can be absolutely unhelpful for someone who is wounded and he. So I think really, uh, I would not talk about in a homily. Actually, I think it has to be in a personal way, like workshops, personal counseling, um, treated in a very uh, prudent way, I would say, and and immediately, and and that's how I have I have treated the topic with the victims, and and when I when I um, feel that that it's a helpful reality, immediately I explain to them. But if not, of course, I will not. Um, I think that there, there, is not, there is not survivors, but each survivor is unique. So we cannot generalize. And that is why um, I think it's not fair to say, oh, because it harms some survivors, so then we do not talk about it. Because each survivor is unique. For me personally, it has helped me. For the survivors I have worked, for many of them have helped them. For some not. But I have never, never impose the vision or or talk about if they don't want to talk about it 
And so I think it's like any pastoral approach that we have to have to any topic, not just to the topic of Jesus as a victim, but uh, not because of the harm, we, we do not talk things uh, because we have, it's as any topic, I think. That's, that would be my, my pastoral answer. Thank you. I think uh, also, Helen, just to add to what Rocio says, and Rocio, uh, correct me if I have it wrong, but in terms of both studies with survivors that we undertook, when survivors indicated that it wasn't helpful to them, they weren't suggesting it was harmful. I don't think we've had any experience of survivors telling us it's harmful. That They've just said, well, it's not directly helpful. Now, I think part of that is because the people we've talked to have been engaging with the idea as we've tried to develop it and express it carefully. There is perhaps a danger that people who are not careful with the idea, who, who don't develop it care for, carefully, uh, are more likely to, to have harmful consequences. So th there is clearly the need to develop this work, as within any work addressing sexual violence, in a careful, sensitive, appropriate pastoral way. Uh, there, there's a challenge in that. It's not easy, but but we do believe it can be done and we do believe it can have very cons positive consequences if it's done well. But there's no guarantee that it will be done well. But the, the best way of trying to ensure it's done well is having constructive, careful conversations. I suppose the other comment I would make is I think some of the uh, wary response to it comes from uh, an expectation that we're making very unfounded claims or, or claims of a very high level of violence rather than taking carefully the argument that, that is being, being made. So I think, again, it may come from perceptions of what's being said and a negative reaction to those perceptions rather than a careful engagement with the ideas themselves. Could you foresee writing this in a in a popular level book, David, or or um, a series of Bible studies, or maybe commissioning somebody else to do that? We sincerely hope the SCM book will be popular. We we absolutely uh, well. It's, sorry, I, you know what I mean. It's 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 still a, quite a technical. I don't mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, fair enough. But so one of the things we we've done is is to develop a community level Bible study. This this was the work that was able to partner with Gerald West and Ujima Community on. Um, that's that's still South African focused at the moment, but it it is a a Bible study that I think would um, transfer to other contexts in terms of the underlying methodology and the discussion based approach. Uh, Jamie Reeves and I were invited to uh, present it for a, a chaplaincy event at University of Reading, and it was very well received on, on Zoom a year or so ago. So I think the Bible study part um, works works well and and would work across. And I do think they're tremendously creative and accomplished liturgists and uh, people who work with the Bible and others who can help engage with this work in a way that would be readily accessible and uh, appropriate in all sorts of contexts. I, I think that's the work that still needs to be done. And it, it might be that, um, Others need to be very involved in, in that for the full range of expertise to be brought. But, but the short answer to your question is, yes, I, I'm absolutely certain it can be done. Thank you. I've actually, oh, Natalie. Can I just say one thing? Um, I was thinking as I read the book that if, if I mean, there are certainly, even in the book, those who, are, who talk about their struggle with associating with Jesus as a, as a victim of sexual violence, but there were a number of biblical characters that were introduced as part of this matrix of meaning that could be more appropriate for certain people. You know, the story of Tamar um, and the, those are all linked. You know, the biblical text links those then to Jesus. So there's a kind of a way to to engage with that concept without going straight to Jesus, which might be unsettling. Thank you.
Uh, Rosia, I think you're on mute. Was that because you wanted to come in? Yes. Hello. No, for example, it made me think about one of the victims, uh, one of the survivors um, proposed it would be so important to talk about this in the liturgy. And she said, I would like, for example, sometimes to hear as we talk about Jesus, Jesus free me from seeing Jesus say, OK, Jesus, you have, have been humiliated in your body. Help all the ones who have been humiliated in their body. So I think there are ways in which in which we can introduce and this was a proposal of a, actually of a person who is not a christian anymore and she proposed that prayer to be introduced in 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 the language of the liturgy uh, for for healing so i think yes it's, it's necessary we, there are ways uh, subtle subtle ways and and that are not harmful that we can introduce also this idea Thank you. That was that was really helpful. Um, just to emphasize, just to mention again, I'm not going to call on people with hands up. I'm only going to take questions from the chat and I won't be able to take them all just um, just to, just to mention that now. Um, oh, I had one in my head. It's just completely gone. No. Nope. OK, I'll come back to that one. <laughs> um, I've got a question here about um, speaking about experience of um, Tamils and um, Dalits um, and some it, it was it, it was the message didn't go publicly so only I've seen it but it's it, some some really um, dreadful things done to um, women in, in those situations um, and just asking you to reflect on I, I, I guess really the intersectionality question um, but but reflect on caste and ethnicity and in and how that um, might be brought in brought to bear upon this So I'll, I'll have a go at that first and then Rosia might want to add. Um, so in the last couple of years, I've read a number of reports from Sri Lanka and they have even being familiar with um, torture and detention centers from Latin America. I've been um, really surprised at, at the level of violence in torture centers in, in Sri Lanka. And one of the striking things which comes out of those reports is how readily stripping is used, how often stripping leads to other forms of sexual assault and, and sexual violence. Stripping very often is, is the precursor and preparatory stage to that. But it was also used very evenly against both male and female uh, victims in Sri Lankan detention centers. And, that, and the Sri Lankan studies really brought that home to me. In terms of how much intersectionality, certainly in that context, it was uh, invariably Sinhalese against Tamil, that there was certainly an ethnic dimension against it. And it seemed to introduce an added layer and edge to the violence. And I think that's often the case as well, uh, that sexual violence is often ethnicized. So it's given additional layers because of the ethnic dimension. Uh, obviously, lynching is one of the most obvious examples of that. And Mitzi Smith, uh, I imagine, will will address that in, in the presentation. But yes, I suppose what I'm saying is sexual violence often draws in other forms of power imbalance, other forms of domination and uh, interaction, and it absolutely makes sense, I would agree with, with the question, to include an intersectional analysis whenever you're thinking uh, about sexual violence issues. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Well, I'm going to come back in with a question I was um, had in my head before, um, which is um, that if we think about again, it's a theological question, I suppose, um, but it relates to the um, the incarnation and to um, the sense in which um, all human experience can is is taken up in the in the incarnate Jesus. And that theological belief is not dependent upon Jesus having actually shared a particular experience. So, for example, um, Jesus never experienced miscarriage. 
Um, and yet, um, most Christians would believe that somehow the, the, the suffering and pain of that is, is taken and, and participated in um, by Jesus. So if, if that is the case, um, do, does, does that lessen the benefit, perhaps, or, or perhaps that's a clumsy way of putting it, but does, does that make it less necessary for us to um, understand Jesus as a survivor of sexual abuse? I think that really helpfully points to an important distinction between what I would see as theological and biblical here. So my reading of, of Matthew 25, which is where we took for the title, When Did We See You Naked?, offers a theological understanding of Jesus sharing in the experiences and the suffering of others. And in as much as others suffer, so Jesus suffers in as much as you treat others in a particular way, so you treat Jesus. So that for me provides a, a theological grounding for understanding Jesus sharing in the suffering of others, even if Jesus doesn't directly experience that suffering him, himself and miscarriage all sorts of other human experiences that he didn't suffer. But I think there's a theological grounding for recognizing uh, a wider sharing in those experiences. So that I would call a theological angle, and it would be Matthew 25 focused for uh, a different angle, uh, to my mind, both historical and biblical, because I think the biblical texts are revealing something historical here, though some people might challenge, well, how can we really get behind the biblical text? But um, in terms of different to the theological argument based on 20, Matthew 25, looking at Matthew 27, I think it just simply is the case that Jesus did experience sexual abuse. That That's what the text are telling us. I don't think he had to do that. I don't think there's a necessity to, well, that had to happen. I think it's just simply what the texts say did, did happen. I, I would like to think it didn't have to happen. Um, but the fact is, to my mind at least, looking at the text, that that did happen. So I think we've got two separate conversations to be had, that the one around the biblical texts um, and what they're saying, I think, did happen. The one around the theology, around more, more general questions of sharing in suffering and responding at, at that level. And, and for me, at least, I wouldn't want to make the claim that Jesus had to suffer in this way. It, it, that, that's not something I know, and it's not something I would want to comment on. Um, the, the comment is on Matthew 27, that that's what the text is saying he, he did experience. Thank you. I, I would like to add of what uh, David has said is that um, for me, there are two dimensions also. One is that effectively uh, he was sexually humiliated in his own body. So for me, there is no question about it because for me, enforced nudity is um, sexual humiliation. He didn't need to suffer that, but we will have, I would think why is also important um, because usually in the Christian realm, we have put a Jesus like an asexual person. So um, particularly in the Catholic church and in many churches, all the sexual dimension is like a taboo that no one addresses, that no one talks about it. And, and I think it's harmful because it's such an important dimension that if we do not take talk about the healthy dimension of sexuality, we are not able to talk about the perversion. So when, when we do not link any, uh, we create a, this, this image of Jesus that it seems that he was not a male, not a sexual person. We, in one way, dehumanize Christ. So I think also of talking about Jesus humiliated in his body, we are talking about this, this uh, human incarnated Jesus that is not just, um, you know, a, 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 like a idealized Jesus who, who have not experienced in his own body the reality of being humiliated. So yes, he didn't need to do that, 
but I think he he yeah he he had to so he suffered that uh, not not because he wanted because it was forced that nudity but also that gives us an element to discuss a topic that we usually we do not want to discuss we do not want to discuss that Jesus had a sexuality like all of us and and that is why also he can save our own um, sexuality and save our own wounds regarding that topic. Thank you. Um, I've got a question about whether um, it was, if you could expand a little bit on the idea of um, the forced stripping of, of Jesus and sexually abusive acts against him arising from dominant um, hegemonic forms of masculinity. Could uh, one of you expand on that? Valerie, uh, is is that something you want to speak to? Otherwise, I'll have a swipe at it. But but I I think you probably uh, mentioned that in your response, which I really appreciated. I'm a slow thinker, so maybe you go first, and then I'll think about it while you're talking. <laughs> so I think it it is helpful. It it's taking us into understanding. Well, well, what's going on here? So. For me, uh, there's absolutely no reason to posit that the soldiers drew uh, personal sexual gratification from what from what happened fr from the stripping. That this is not about uh, sexual pleasure or erotic motivation. It's about power issues. It's about control. It's about asserting the the might and virility of the Roman Empire against someone. Uh, who was seen as subversive to it, who was a troublemaker. Um, and all of this was expressed in power terms that were readily sexualized. Now, in terms of, well, how do we understand how that translates, that the notion of hegemonic masculinity, that there's certain ideals and values of what it is to be a man and a manly man and how you express those, were all very strongly coded in the Roman world, and they readily lent themselves to sexual violence. That, that was how one expressed uh, one's virility. Um, and that makes perfect sense to me. In, in terms of the 500 soldiers in the cohort uh, who are gathered together around this troublemaker who's going to be crucified the, the next day, to understand what's going on, I, I think it is helpful to think of hegemonic masculinity and Roman notions of honor and shame and uh, virility and conquest. So uh, yes, for me, that those all make sense. Thank you. Yes, and just picking up on that, I mean, um, there's quite a bit of research into current hegemonic masculinities, which haven't changed much. Um, the association of being being masculine with being kind of having a frontiermanship spirit, um, conquering, um, being active, not passive, being athletic, being white, um, being thinking, not feeling. Um, so to to enact that power over someone is to identify and associate them with not those things. So if you can become an oppressor and make someone the oppressed, they are automatically then not identified with power. So they are now identified with weakness. Um, and that, you know, going to David's point, this was really the, the point of crucifixion this kind of political statement for people who were rabble rousers who needed to be put into their place. Um, maybe a slave who had, who had been a bit uppity. Um, and it was a symbol to the community of if you try to position yourself in, in terms of power, um, you will be made to be seen. You will, you, we will make you clearly to be associated, not with power, but hum with humiliation. And so it, that, that kind of symbolism was, was hugely important for um, naked, the, the stripping, the kind of public nudity, um, the association with vulnerability, 
um, with being unable to protect oneself. Um, and yeah, as, as, as the first chapters in the book point out, this is something that is carried on in political terror and acts of torture today. This is a common tool used, not just in, in, in the, um, by the state, but in, you know, in private interpersonal violence, domestic violence. This is, this is a common tactic that's used to, to make you feel less, to make you feel vulnerable, weak, and the other person is more powerful. And whatever is more powerful is associated with that hegemonic masculinity. Thank you. Okay, I think we're going to have our final question now. And this is, um, again, one of the um, criticisms that's been leveled, so I'll give you an opportunity to um, respond to this. Um, it could be said that, um, that this idea of Jesus as a um, victim of sexual abuse um, could be used to hold those who have been sexually abused to um, the impossible standard of a silent suffering Jesus. Um, and actually that that might result in, um, in harmful practice and, and, and harmful pastoral practice. Thanks, Helen. If, if I could speak to that, I, I think that is a really good example of, of why care is needed, because religious ideas and values and symbols and expressions can always be adapted in harmful and unhelpful ways. It's, it's absolutely true that the response to that is to not do it and to challenge it when it is done. Um, that that's absolutely correct. For me, again, going back to this distinction between the biblical and the pastoral and the theological, that is a challenge to be addressed at the pastoral level in terms of the pastoral use of this. It, it doesn't change the biblical text and what's in the biblical text at all. It, it doesn't mean that that didn't happen in, in my view, though I accept other people might take the evidence differently. But we need to, it seems to me, separate out the biblical elements of this from well what's done uh, about it and then to do what's done about it well and, and there clearly are challenges and there are ways of dealing with this idea really badly that there, there's no question about that but that's not particular to this idea that that goes for almost all religious ideas and and thinking um, so the challenge becomes to think through how does this lead to a, a an understanding that is um, affirming of human dignity, of uh, human hope and human life? One of the reasons I think this work is important is because if we don't recognize what crucifixion is about, we're not going to understand what resurrection is about. And it is important to understand resurrection and we're not going to do that until we've understood cru crucifixion. So there are positive reasons, but the discussion has to be done well. Um, and there are dangers in the process that people will introduce unhelpful theological ideas. That's not new. They need to be discussed. They need to be challenged. Perhaps they need, need to be refined. And it needs to be done with a sense of, of humility that we don't know the answers yet. We need to hear from each other what's helpful and what's not helpful and explore other alternatives. We're still at a very early stage in this process. I would like to add from my own experience, you know, after leaving the community, I really had a terrible crisis of faith and I felt abandoned by God. Actually, I couldn't enter to a church. I couldn't enter, I couldn't see a crucifix. Uh, because just seeing, and I hadn't, first, I hadn't had the idea of Jesus as a victim, just seeing the crucifix, I couldn't just handle to feel that God abandoned me. I couldn't handle to see that God wants in one way suffering. So what I'm saying is that uh, when you have trauma, anything can trigger your own trauma, anything. So that is why we pastors, we ministers, we have to be so careful and so respectful. And, you know, we cannot do any this, any spiritual, theological argument or, this, or discussion if we do not accompany the person in this journey. 
So um, I have accompanied many victims and with many victims, I have never used the word God, church, Christ, because they cannot handle it, because they, it triggers too many things. So I have to use, use other paths. But there are others, for example, that when that is why for me accompanying and joining with the victims is absolutely necessary. And, and then you can see when when do it, when when accompany them, when propose some topics, when do not do it. I think it's it's really a very uh, pastoral topic to 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 think about. Okay. Valerie? I'll just add this link in the message to um, my now former colleague, Katie Edwards, who did um, a recording on this topic, Silence of the Lamb, where she talks about the silence of Jesus and, and how she was, how she grappled with that as a victim of sexual violence. And I think it's quite moving. Um, so I recommend it. Thank you. Let me just, um explain how I think we should conclude the evening. Um, I'm going to say a few closing <laughs> remarks. Um, and then, obviously, you're free to go at any point, but then you may wish to go straight away. What I'm going to suggest is, though, that after I've just said the thank yous, I'm going to read one um, verse from the Book of Lamentations, um, which for those who um, are familiar with the Bible will know that this is a book written in deep grief um, over actually the sacking of a city, but it is expressed as a woman who has been sexually violated. I'm going to read one verse which just seems to connect so much of what we've been speaking about tonight. And then I'm going to suggest that for those who would like to remain with us, we will just hold silence for one more minute. Um, and then we will just, um, please feel free to obviously go at any point, but I would just like us to conclude um, in that, in that way of, of honouring and and um, and just respecting what has been said, the personal stories that have been shared, um, and, uh, and 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 all that lies behind them. So um, I would just like, on behalf of everyone here, to say a huge thank you so much um, to David and Rocio for this um, really um, stirring and disturbing, in in the best sense of the word, book. Um, and uh, for your participation tonight, for what you've shared, um, for your, your wise responses. And Valerie, I bring you in, of course, as well. Thank you so much for your um, really helpful response to this book and for your own responses on the panel as well, for what you have shared as well about your own story. I'm hugely grateful for, um, for the wisdom, for the, for the depth, theological depth, for the um, vulnerability, um, and just for the immensely, I think, practical um, and helpful things that have been shared tonight. Would are, any of the three of you like to say anything um, in, in just as we conclude? Just to thank you, Helen, it's been an absolute pleasure to, to join you this, this evening, this morning. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Then for those who'd like to stay, I'll read this one verse and then we'll just hold silence. Is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow. <laughs>